Thomas Tessier's World of Hurt. This is Chris L. McKenna. Now, I have been a rabid fan of Mr. Tessier's horror fiction ever since I was a teenager. But if you are unfamiliar with his work, allow me to illuminate. Mr. Tessier is an American author who has penned ten novels and dozens of short stories to popular and critical acclaim. He's also made fans of some of the titans in horror literature. Stephen King called his book The Night Walker the best werewolf story in 20 years. The late, great Peter Straub said, Tessier finds the unexpected poetry and subtlety in horror. There are many who feel his short stories are where he's at his best. His collection, Thomas Tessier's World of Hurt, won the International Horror Guild Award in 2019, and, to quote the Washington Post, Tessier's massive retrospective, World of Hurt, assembles 28 stories and novellas from a distinguished 40-year career. Each story in this collection resonates. Each, without exception, is chilling, unsettling, and beautifully composed. Tessier is one of the genre's reigning masters, and World of Hurt may prove to be the centerpiece of his legacy. Well, in this series, we will be bringing all of those stories to life. Now, as far as why I am the perfect choice to host this show, I grew up in Watertown, Connecticut, the same town Mr. Tessier hails from, and I spent some of my favorite summer afternoons sitting in his writing basement and talking horror. I've had the privilege of narrating two of his audiobooks, both available on Audible right now, Rapture and Finishing Touches, but this is the very first time any of his short stories will be in audio format, and I'm very excited to be a part of it. We'll have guest stars, original music, and even some words with the author. His books and stories have haunted me since I was a teenager. And now, they're going to be your problem. Without further ado, the first story in our curated collection was originally published in the Borderlands Anthology 1990 and goes by the innocuous title, Evelyn Grace. So, Evelyn Grace was dead, from a drug overdose at the age of 38. Her body was found on the floor of the studio flat in East Los Angeles, where she had been living for the last seven months. She had been a model, an actress, a singer, and she was unemployed at the time of her death. <sighs> Evelyn Grace. Dead. An accident, or so the coroner had ruled. But it was not impossible to imagine that Evie had known exactly what she was doing with her last needle. Or that she had been murdered for some bizarre California-type reason. In fact, it was easy to imagine all sorts of things about Evie. She had always been the kind of girl who made a guy's blood run away with his mind. Tim LeClerc refolded his newspaper and set it aside. He lit a cigarette. He knew her, but they had never met. He and Evelyn Grace had been in the same graduating class at high school, back in the late 60s. They had been in different groups, however, and they didn't live in the same neighborhood. So for four years, they passed each other in the corridors at school, but their paths never really crossed. Tim had been aware of her. It was hard not to be. But she had probably never known that he existed. In a class of nearly 200, there were bound to be quite a few strangers, even after all that time. Bitter early March, the land still frozen. Locked up beneath steel clouds and day-old snow that was already tarnished with the grime of Utica. The wind hit Tim's face like cold fire as he ran from the diner to his car. It was then, while he sat huddled and shivering, waiting for the engine to idle down and the heater to generate some feeble warmth, that the idea came to him. He would go to Evie's wake. Why not? He was curious to see her again, even if she was dead. Or maybe because she was dead, and that was morbid. But on the other hand, her parents would appreciate the gesture. You can never have too many visitors at a wake. It was only about twenty miles away, in Rome. Besides, he had no one to rush home to, nor anything better to do with this evening. That was how far he'd gotten, Tim thought. Twenty-odd miles in twenty-odd years. Ah, never mind. He'd seen enough of the world when he was in the army to realize that upstate New York was the place for him. He came back alive and whole and settled into a modest but clean apartment on the eastern edge of Utica. After a few false starts, he had landed a decent job at the bottling plant and had been there ever since. Nothing to crow about, but it was a life and it had its occasional moments. <laughs> 
although Tim would be hard-pressed to enumerate many of them. When he wanted female company, he could always find it. Somebody's neglected wife, or a divorcee on the wrong side of thirty, or any other woman at work who were still single because they were overweight or ugly or too crushingly dull to snag a mate. Nothing romantic, but the years had given Tim a rather functional attitude to sex. His was just an ordinary life. But he never regretted it or felt sorry for himself. He liked it the way it was. Uncluttered and straightforward. Low-key, but comfortable. At least he would never be shipped home in a steel box in the cargo hold of a jet plane while strangers drank cocktails overhead. Funny how he'd been to Vietnam and escaped that fate, while Evelyn went to L.A. and hadn't. Poor Evie. Tim polished his dress shoes. He put on his best shirt and tie and his only suit. He had second thoughts while driving to the wake, but promptly dismissed them. If he felt awkward when he got there, he would just take a quick look at her, mumble some words to the parents, and then leave. That's probably what he would do anyway. No sense sitting around once his juvenile curiosity had been satisfied. But what actually happened was shockingly pathetic. Mr. and Mrs. Grace were the only people there when Tim arrived. He felt very odd indeed as he crossed the room and knelt down at the open casket. For a few moments he was occupied with Evie. She looked lovely still, her face virtually unmarked by the years and events of her life. The mortician had done a good job, applying no more makeup than was absolutely necessary. Even now, she retained her girlish good looks. The ghostly afterimage of a beauty you never forget once you've encountered it. Tim was touched by her haunting appearance, saddened by the fact that her life had plummeted to this abrupt end. And he found himself wishing that he had met her when they were in high school together. How different everything might be now, for the both of them. It was an idle fantasy, of course, but... Tim believed there was a kernel of truth in it. Don't all lives have at least one turning point that's fluky or accidental or capricious? Too bad. Too bad. At last he stood up and turned to Evie's parents. Leonard Grace was small and wiry, with a scattering of white fuzz about his largely bare scalp. His manner was bright and alert, though he nodded his head too often, as if to emphasize his agreeable and understanding nature. Charlotte Grace was plump, with a moon face and a distracted air. It took Tim a few minutes to notice that now and then she would fade right out of the conversation, like a distant radio signal drifting in the ether. She had run the family for as long as it had existed, was Tim's guess, but now she was probably an Alzheimer's case. Tim explained that he had been to high school with Evelyn, and her parents were very grateful to him for taking the time to come to the wake. He didn't actually say that he had been a friend of their daughter, but they somehow got that idea and he saw no need to clarify the matter. It was such a sad situation. Two old people, one of them not quite all there, alone with the dead body of their only child. And hardly anyone came. The calling hours were from seven to nine, and in that time perhaps half a dozen people appeared to pay their respects. They were older folks acquaintances of the parents, and none of them stayed more than ten minutes. It was amazing, shocking to Tim, who had expected a rather large turnout. A lot of people would have moved away over the years, but there still had to be plenty of former friends and classmates of Evelyn's left in Rome. So where were they? It was as if nobody wanted to admit knowing her. But why? Just because she'd been something of a bad girl? Running off to California, living a wild, silly, rotten life? Because she met her squalid death at an age when she should have been organizing bake sales and ferrying kids to Little League games? I see Evelyn Grace is dead. Tisk tisk tisk. Well, it was to be expected. <sighs> Smug, self-satisfied bastards. I didn't even know her, Tim thought. But I'm a better friend to her now than all those people ever were. She never wrote to us. Mrs. Grace said to Tim. She did too, Mummy, Mr. Grace put in gently. Never wrote, never called. We never knew where she was or what she was doing. And she sent postcards, 
and she did call up on the telephone every now and again, let us know she was okay. Once a year, or once a year, at best. Well, some people are like that, Tim rationalized. Me, I can't write a letter to save my life. It was a terrible choice of words, he realized immediately. But fortunately, Mrs. Grace was already on another wavelength, and Mr. Grace merely nodded agreeably. A few minutes before nine, when no one else had arrived for more than half an hour, Mrs. Grace whispered something urgent to her husband. Tim, would you mind hanging on here a minute while I take Mommy to the can? Uh, sure. No sooner had the old couple left the room than one of the young funeral home flunkies glanced in, checked the wall clock against his watch, and left. Charged by the minute, Tim thought sarcastically. He stood up and walked to the casket. It seemed very strange to be alone with Evie. At her wake. Once again, he was struck by how attractive she looked. And death shall have no dimension. He vaguely recalled a line from a poem in high school English class. Without thinking, Tim reached to Evie with his right hand, knowing that his body shielded the gesture in case anyone came into the room. He hesitated briefly, afraid he would make a mess of the cosmetics if he touched her face, afraid her fingers would grasp at his if he touched her hands. Trembling, he let his palm settle on her breast. The experience was so confused between the real and the imagined that he wasn't at all sure what he actually felt. A pleasantly firm young female breast. Or something harder and dead. A mixture of sawdust and embalming chemicals. When he removed his hand, he felt a jangling rush of guilt and excitement. But he was more pleased than ashamed. He'd had his little moment of intimacy with Evie who had always been not only untouchable, but unapproachable to him. You will be there tomorrow, Mr. Gray said when he and his wife returned. Won't you? It was a plea, not a question. Yes, of course, Tim replied, although he hadn't planned to attend the funeral as well. We had to pay the funeral home for pallbearers. Twenty-five dollars apiece. Mommy, please. I'll see you in the morning, Tim said trying to smile comfortingly as he shook hands with them. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Tim called the bottling plant in the morning and told them he was taking a sick day. It was crisp and clear outside with a hint of thaw in the air. He felt good and he had slept well which Tim attributed to the kindness he'd shown Mr. and Mrs. Grace by sitting with them for two hours and promising to attend the Mass. It wasn't often he had the chance to do something nice like that for a couple of old folks. His own parents had died within three months of each other several years ago, and his only living aunt and uncle were in Scottsdale, Arizona. Mr. and Mrs. Grace needed him last night, and this morning, almost as if he were a son or a nephew or an old family friend. But it was not just altruism on Tim's part that pleased him. The bleak circumstances of Evie's death, the fact that virtually no one came to her wake, the way her parents had assumed him into their tiny circle, and the feel of her breast in his hand. All of these things combined somehow to bestow on Tim a curious share in Evie's life. And however peculiar that might be, he genuinely liked it. There were more people at the funeral mass than had attended the wake, but Tim was sure that most, if not all of them, were just the usual band of daily churchgoers. One of the pallbearers wore a green bowling league jacket. Aside from the funeral home crew and the priest, Tim and Evelyn's parents were the only ones at her graveside. Mrs. Grace turned wobbly and started to moan when it was time to leave, while Mr. Grace struggled to maintain a semblance of glassy-eyed composure. Tim helped them both walk along the gravel paths to the car. You will follow us back to the house, Tim, Mr. Grace said as he stood by the door of the funeral home Cadillac. Oh, no, thank you, but... He put his hand on Tim's shoulder and gave a beseeching squeeze. Please, Tim, come along for a little while. We'll have some coffee and, and pastry. <sighs> Mommy was up till after midnight cooking. She couldn't sleep at all. Tim sighed inwardly, 
It didn't seem right that Evie's folks should have to return directly home alone. It was bad enough for them to have to forego the normal post-funeral reception with its sustaining presence of family and friends. But to have no one, no one at all, even to share a cup of coffee with, after they'd just buried their daughter. Well, that was simply too much. Sure, Tim agreed. I'll follow you. The Grace home was a cramped little asbestos-shingled house of the working-class 30s vintage. Not much, but no doubt it had seemed palatial, even miraculous, when it was built and first occupied during the Depression. Easy to imagine a girl like Evie desperate to escape from here. But for Tim, there was something nostalgically comfortable about it. He had grown up in much the same sort of place, and not nearly so far from this one as he had thought. When you go back to the old neighborhood, the distances collapse. The yards shrink, and houses that once looked big turn into boxy chicken coops. Tim and Mr. Grace sat in the living room and chatted, while Mrs. Grace brewed the coffee and prepared a platter of pastries. It was desultory, inconsequential talk about Rome, the old days, and the rapidly changing times that had overtaken everyone. Tim and Mr. Grace were in agreement that most of the changes were not really for the better. AstroTurf, for instance. It was not until Mrs. Grace had rejoined them and they were all sipping fresh perked coffee and nibbling delicious sesame rum sweet cakes that the conversation finally gathered itself around the subject of Evelyn. It was soon clear to Tim that there was a huge, aching mystery at the center of their existence, and that it had to do entirely with the missing years of Evelyn's life, from the day she'd left home years ago until the day before yesterday, when she'd been air-freighted back to her parents. Everything in between was a cloud of unknowing, a dense fog broken only by the occasional spark of a phone call here, a postcard there, which perversely enhanced the darkness rather than illuminated it. Evie was a riddle to Tim as well, but he had been thinking about her quite a bit these last couple of days, not logically, but intuitively, since they'd finally crossed paths only because of her death and his curiosity. There were some things he knew— others that he deduced or reasoned out for himself. And most of all, there was everything he found himself wishing, imagining. It amounted to the same thing in the end. Evie was in the purely residual phase of her incarnation. So it was up to him. I didn't want to go into it last night at the wake, Tim said. There wasn't enough time and I didn't know how you would take it, but... I do want to tell you, Evie and I were good friends for many years. Ever since high school, in fact. And... Evie? Who's Evie? Evelyn, Mommy, hush now. Let the boy talk. Mr. Grace leaned forward in the seat, every aspect of his presence fixed intently on Tim. Mrs. Grace was annoyed at her husband for his rare show of assertiveness, but she said nothing about it and made an effort to pay attention. Well, what can I say? Tim went on hesitantly. Evie and I were good friends and ever since high school. Of course, we did lose track of each other for a while after that, but when I got out of the Army, I thought I'd stay on the West Coast for a while and uh, see if I could find a good job there, and we ran into each other again. We went out a lot, uh, had fun together, that kind of thing. She was busy trying to make a career for herself, and in the meantime, I'd found decent work at a defense plant. But we still managed to get together a couple of nights a week and on weekends. And, well, we got pretty serious. And there were times when I was sure we'd get married and settle down to a more normal life, you know. But something or other always seemed to get in the way of it. So it was a off-again, on-again type of relationship. But even when we were off, we were still great friends. I always loved Evie, no matter what. And uh, I think she loved me most of the time. <laughs> I know she did. But we never managed to get it to the next stage. I wish that we had. We'd stayed in touch up until a couple months ago when I decided that it was never going to work out and I was ready for a change in my life. So, so I made up my mind to move back here. We talked maybe once or twice on the phone right after I moved, but that was it. Mr. Grace's mouth was slightly open and his throat muscles worked mightily either to shut it or to say something, but he did neither. 
Mrs. Grace appeared to be no less fascinated by what Tim had said, but she didn't look as completely surprised as her husband did. Tim had paused to catch his breath, and his wits, he could only hope. He had said enough, too much, and it had taken off on him at once. All he wanted to do was give him something to cling to, a few dressed-up facts to fill in some of the vast blank spot that Evie had left them. But no sooner had he started than the story took on a life of its own and became an account of his long love affair with Evie. Is that crazy or what? Tim wondered. But he had enjoyed it, too. Such an extraordinary thrill. To hear those things. To know that they were rising from a buried part of his brain. That they put him into Evie's life. And Evie into his. Tim marveled that he hadn't contradicted anything he had previously said to Mr. and Mrs. Grace. But it was clear to him that they'd accept whatever he told them. They just wanted to hear as much as they could about their daughter. And that was the problem. Tim had merely opened the door. Go on! Yes, please, Tim, tell us more. Reluctant, feeling trapped by his own good intentions, but at the same time secretly delighted, Tim continued to elaborate his impromptu saga of Evelyn Grace's missing years. Her efforts to make it as a folk singer, then a rock singer, finally as a country and western singer. Her two or three non-speaking parts in forgettable movies. The picture of Evie perched atop a Harley that was used for the front cover of a biker magazine. Another one showing her menaced by a man with a knife that appeared in a true crime magazine. The in-between jobs. Waitressing in some pretty good restaurants and nightclubs. Serving drinks in an L.A. airport bar. That sort of thing. The occasional respite taken in an unemployment line. Recharging the batteries for the next time around. Nothing too shabby, nothing unrespectable, but never any breakthrough. The long, hard road of a pretty young woman chasing her ambition down the years in Los Angeles. Woven throughout like a bright gold thread was Tim's love for Evie, and her sometime love for him. Tim went on about how he was still sad that they had never been able to make it a permanent relationship, a marriage how he had learned to accept that. Now he consoled himself by thinking of the happier memories he had of Evie, and by reminding himself that, in spite of her weaknesses and failings, she had been a good person. Tim wanted to finish there, on the kind of life-affirming note people strive for in funeral situations. He felt tired, and it seemed as if he had been talking for hours. But Evie's mother and father were not quite through with him yet. The end, Tim. You have to tell us what happened to her at the end. Yep. Yeah, what about the drugs? Oh, well, some of the movie people she knew, I, I guess they introduced her to cocaine somewhere along the line, and then the harder stuff. Yeah, I tried to get her off it, but once you're hooked, it's rough. You have to make a total commitment, and Evie could never bring herself to that point, you know, where she was willing. I mean, that's the main reason why I had to give up at last and get out of the scene altogether. I couldn't change her, and I couldn't bear to watch what was happening to her, so so I packed up my stuff and I came back here. And she let me go. The guy who was supplying all her drugs meant more to her than I did. Did he use her? They get them hooked and then they use them. Well, I don't know about that, Tim replied. He didn't like this because it tainted his own newly developed feelings for Evie. It was probably unavoidable. She had died of a heroin overdose. But it seemed so distasteful. All I know is I lost her. We all lost her, in the end. Mr. Grace looked subdued and thoughtful in the long silence that followed. Mrs. Grace seemed to be formulating some response, but it never reached the stage of spoken words. Tim was about to leave when Evelyn's father took him aside. Come with me a minute. Leading Tim up a narrow flight of stairs. They went into a small bedroom. Obviously it had been Evie's. Tim, they sent back these two boxes of things with her. Personal effects. Not much, as you can see, but... Well, I was thinking maybe you'd like to take a minute and look through them. We might find something in there, some little keepsake to take home and remember her by. Tim was going to refuse, but it would probably be rude to do so. Besides, he liked the idea too much. Thank you, he said. Feel free, take your time. Come down when you're finished. Okay. <laughs> 
Tim waited as the old man's footsteps faded away. Then he sat down on the bed. Evie's bed. For a moment, he pictured her as the most gorgeous girl in high school, the way she had been then. In this room. In this bed. He remembered seeing her at the lake on the day after the senior prom. She was with her crowd, and she was wearing a bikini that would be demure by today's standards. No one had a tan in June. Evie had snowy blonde hair, long, pale thighs. It was sweet for Tim to pause there, to enjoy once again the permanence of her beauty. Not much was right. The two cardboard cartons were filled for the most part with cheap clothes, sneakers, jeans, t-shirts, socks. No dresses, no jackets, nothing very good. Evie had had very little left at the end. Her flimsy life stripped down to the minimum. He had to find something he could show to Mr. Grace and thank him for. The cheap plastic barrette would do nicely. And it smelled of Evie's hair. At least her hairspray. Tim reached down to the bottom of the second box and pulled up a handful of bras and panties. Startled, he dropped them. But then he relaxed, smiled, and allowed himself to examine them. Red and blue and lavender. Not a white in the bunch. Evie's bra size was 36C, for breasts that were ample but not excessive. Tim had been aware of that as far back as ninth grade, and as recently as last night. He held a pair of delicate purple cotton briefs to his face. God in heaven, they still had the delicious, unwashed scent of her in them. Tim quickly shoved the panties into his jacket pocket, and then carefully arranged the other things back in the boxes. He held the barrette conspicuously in his hand and went downstairs. Mrs. Grace was still sitting where he had left her. She gave him a strained smile as he came into the living room. He started to say something to her, and before he even hit the carpet. His hands were useless, floppy things, and his vision skittered away like marbles on a hardwood floor. The flat part! The flat part! Not the edge! That's my best skillet! Tim's empty hands were bound together behind him with some sticky plastic stuff. Packing tape, he realized dimly. And then his feet. His head wouldn't be clear, but he tried to speak. It was impossible to put words together. He tried to focus his sight on the plastic barrette, which he was aware of somewhere near his face on the floor. Oh, you son of a bitch! You could have saved her! You were the only one who could have saved her! We couldn't talk to her. We couldn't do anything with her. That's the way it is. Sometimes with parents and kids, you just can't do anything. No matter what you try, it doesn't work. But you could have saved her. You loved her, but you walked away and you left her there to die. You left her there with that other son of a bitch who was pumping dope into her. Well, the least he could have done was make her call home once a week. Washed his hands of her. That's what he did. Again, Tim tried to speak, but as soon as he opened his mouth, he was kicked in the jaw. His tongue hurt, and he tasted his own blood. He felt the old man's hands on his body, emptying each of his pockets. Oh, no. Oh, no, no. Don't do that. Oh, where's his car keys? Here we go. Uh, 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 look at this, Mommy! Look! This son of a bitch was trying to steal Evelyn's underwear! Oh, didn't want to bring her home, no, just her underpants and do. Whispering, Jesus. Tim listened as Mr. Grace explained to his wife that he was going to drive Tim's car into downtown Rome, leave it there, and then walk back to the house. She was to do nothing until he got home except hit Tim with the skillet again if he tries to cause trouble for her. Move his car? Oh, that was bad. But I can get out of this, Tim told himself. Even if she is half gone, I can talk to her. I could distract her, confuse her, and work myself free. I should have known, he thought. The one thing he had steered clear of in his story was why Evie had cut herself off from these people, to the point where she communicated with them only once or twice per year and then by postcard or telephone. It had seemed too delicate to mention, and he had no idea of what might be involved, but now it came to him. Evie might have had her reasons. Tim's mistake may have been to assume, like everyone else, that Evie had been a bad child, selfish, unfaring, neglectful of her parents. Now he knew that there must have been another side to the story. Evie's side. And he was stuck in it. Doesn't he need his car to drive home? He isn't going home. 
Tomorrow we'll drive him up to Canada and dump him there in the woods. I don't even want that son of a bitch in the same country. When he heard his car being driven away, Tim looked at Mrs. Grace. He gathered himself, tried to clear his throat and speak. But the woman rose from her seat and approached him. She had a roll of tape in her hand. I don't want to see you. I don't even want to hear you. And I sure don't want you looking at me. Oh, no. Tim thought as he saw her yank a length of tape from the roll. She bit it loose, and he noticed a couple of fugitive sesame seeds clinging to her dentures. She slapped the tape over Tim's mouth to keep him from talking. Then, at a more leisurely pace, Evelyn's mother began to wrap the rest of his head in tape. He thrashed his body as wildly as possible, but he couldn't stop her. And when his head was done, she proceeded on down around his arms, eventually securing his knees. It was a big roll of tape, and Mrs. Grace used all of it. Ah, <sighs> now that's better. Grotesque, Tim thought. Grotesque. He pictured himself as a kind of slapdash mummy, rotting away in the Canadian woods, say fifty yards from a back road. The Graces wouldn't be able to drag him any farther than that, but would he ever be found? It was such an outrageous and unreal image that Tim was, even now, incapable of feeling mere panic or terror. Instead, his mind was overwhelmed with a profound sense of exasperation. If only his story had been true, and he and Evie had been in love for a while, then he wouldn't be where he is now, and Evie would still be alive because Tim would never have walked away from her. He would never have settled for an unhappy ending with Evie. Not in real life. Tim's lungs felt like they were being clamped in a waffle iron, the oxygen slowly burning out of them. The last conscious thought he had was a rich and vivid recall of the last conscious smell he had experienced. Evelyn Grace's Cunt The End Guest starring Jaylee Hoyt Original music by Jordan Peer This has been a Watertown Arts production.